Joining me this morning for a bit of an update on the health of our community and some upcoming things that are going on, Dr. Brad Greenberg is joining me here in the studio from San Juan Regional Medical Center. Dr. Greenberg, good morning. Great to see you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming in. We saw you a lot when we were talking about uh, COVID-19. You were a regular guest on KSJE, and we appreciate your time. You gave a lot during that time when you were really, really busy. And so nice to have you come back. Went a little bit calmer, maybe, but still some things on the horizon that we want to talk about. And so thank you for, for, for coming in. We're hearing a lot about, of course, um, well, all of them, really, COVID and flu and RSV. And so I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about all these things. It seems to be kind of this trifecta of infections that are that are out there. And so can you give us kind of a local... Um, status report, I guess, of, of how the community is doing and what you're seeing at San Juan Regional Medical Center these days with all these three things going on. Absolutely. And I, it, it is a really a unique time right now. We, we do always see influenza True, and time RSV and COVID. And COVID's been around now. We're in the third year of this uh, pandemic, you know, and we're sort of transitioning between the pandemic and an endemic phase. We really understand a lot of the variables about how the patterns of illness but flu has been with us for a very long time. And RSV has been with us for also for a very long time. But this year is different. Flu is presenting earlier. RSV is presenting earlier. We're seeing uh, very large numbers of folks with RSV, especially the very young and the very old, presenting and with relatively severe illness as well. So, um, you know, they're, but they are three different illnesses. They present very similarly. Right. So, you know, Let's say you have any of these illnesses. You could have a cough or runny nose, a fever, sore throat, body aches, decreased appetite. But there are some hallmarks. Um, for example, influenza often presents uh, with a sort of rapid, sudden onset of a high fever and body aches. Um, that's pretty typical. Uh, RSV tends to present more indolently, sort of gradually gets worse, peaks around day four, day five, or day six, and then gradually improves over the subsequent couple weeks. But it's a, it's a cough that just won't go away. In COVID, one of the hallmarks that we've come to understand is the non-respiratory symptoms. For example, it can affect taste or smell, um, and sometimes can be associated with longer term complications like the long COVID syndrome. So we're in a yet another phase of uncharted territory with the pandemic, but uh, we're trying to take all the things that we know about each of these illnesses and respond appropriately. Very good. And, and so with these cases then, San Juan County finds itself kind of average? Are we above average with seeing some of these cases with our population? What are you seeing? Well, we've learned a lot from our experiences with COVID-19. And so we really do try to stay on top of this. And uh, so we actually, on a daily basis, look at the numbers of folks that are admitted to our facility with uh, COVID, influenza, or RSV. And our numbers have been, you know, in the 40s and 50s for some time with all those combined. Um, and we look like we're, uh, we've been following these trends and they're declining a little bit, which is uh, somewhat reassuring. That being said, uh, we continue to see a very high number of folks with RSV and influenza and COVID presenting simultaneously to the hospital. And so, you know, at this time, our, our total number of patients with COVID flu and RSV is 36 as of this morning. 20 of those are COVID patients. And we have eight influenza inpatients and eight RSV inpatients. So a little bit better than it has been over the last couple of weeks, but we still remain uh, very concerned about these numbers. And in a typical year, which I know we haven't had a typical year in three years, um, what would that look like around this time of December? Would, would the patient numbers be about the same with flu and, and cases like that, or is this a little higher than, than pre-COVID times? So the timing really does seem to be kind of off. Um, for influenza, we do see these numbers sort of gradually increase over the winter, starting around now, usually October, and then they kind of get worse. But RSV for us here in this region tended to be a February-March kind of phenomenon. Mm. So seeing these very high numbers, and this has been the case across the country too, where these very high numbers early in the season, some places in the Mid-Atlantic, for example, on the East Coast, um, you know, six, eight weeks ago had extraordinarily high numbers of RSV inpatients. So it's an area of concern. And we wonder why so the timing, which had been um, somewhat of a predictable pattern, is different. You know, it doesn't change our, uh, our sense of needing to be ready to care for those patients, regardless of the time of year. But it is a little bit of a curiosity to see all three of these illnesses presenting like this, like this simultaneously.
Right. And I guess the maybe I'm thinking perhaps maybe we're not masking as much as we used to be. And so we kind of saw a decrease in, in flu cases when we were wearing our masks and washing our hands religiously um, during the height, I think, of COVID-19. And maybe we're getting a little lax in some of those um, things that we were, had been doing. Could that be a contributing factor to some of this earlier um, stuff that we're seeing? I think it's actually a very interesting area of, uh, of discussion. Uh, because there is uh, what's now become described as the immunity gap. The immunity gap is something that's not very well understood, but it's the idea that we've been masking for so long that maybe we haven't been exposed to all these different viruses. Maybe we're sort of uh, lacking some innate defense that's uh, typically associated with it. Uh, sort of an interesting concept that really hasn't been fully studied. But I think what you're getting at, though, is that, and what, what we have come to understand is that all those uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, let's remember social distancing and masking and uh, washing your hands and um, all of those things, they work. And it was really sort of, uh, before we did all those things for COVID-19, it was sort of understood that those things may not necessarily work for influenza, for example. But strangely enough, they did. And sort of rewrote a lot of our understanding. It used to be just vaccines was our only approach. And then you know, best of luck, you know, wash right. your hands and do the right thing. Now, I think there are more tools in the toolbox. And so uh, it could be that uh, a return to some of those practices that everyone got so good at during the pandemic might actually result in some decrease in the disease prevalence in our community. Gotcha. And we're, and we're seeing, and you mentioned it before we came on the air this morning, in some larger cities in this country, um, there are some um, suggestions that folks maybe wear masks in crowded places with lots of other people and things along that because of some of the high rates of COVID is one, but maybe flu and other things as well. I mean, and we've seen it, I think, in some Oriental cultures long before COVID-19 that I think people in Japan and China would wear masks when the air quality was bad or flu season was bad or, or what have you. That's just been an a, a accepted part of their culture for years and years and years. I think that given our experiences with COVID-19, it's likely that masks in some form or another, form or another will be with us. And I think that there is a place for them to be rationally used, um, you know, when the time is right. Now, what you're alluding to as far as other large cities or a development that's really happened in the last couple of days. In the last couple of days, there have been a number of mayors and also governors of states that have requested for federal assistance or even inquired about the, a declaration of uh, an emergency on, for the so-called triple-demic. Um, and the response from the White House essentially has been to the governors uh, to, you know, we, we stand ready to provide you with assistance if needed, um, but no formal declaration of an emergency from the government. Some regions in the country, though, are really suffering with this. Very high numbers of inpatients, especially with the respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, um, and the number of pediatric beds is somewhat limited. And so there are places in the country where they've enacted disaster plans and had to uh, move down their uh, preparedness planning matrices to meet the needs of their community. Because when those folks, when those uh, kids or adults with RSV are in the hospital, it's not just them that are suffering. It's those folks that need hospital level of care that can't access it because those beds are occupied. Very familiar kind of script for what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. So... I, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that it, it good to would be good to draw everyone's attention to is the CDC's community levels. Um, and the community levels are what uh, are behind the recommendations for perhaps increased vigilance, uh, the use of masking, and sort of maybe going back to some of the things that everyone does so well that they did during the pandemic. And when you there are three levels, there's a, there's high, um, a medium, and there's a low level. And so you can look on the website and you can get the updated uh, level for San Juan County. It's updated every week, I believe on Thursdays. And uh, right now, though, the community level for San Juan County is high. And so we have a high disease prevalence. Uh, the state numbers right now, we have a 26.8% positivity rate, and our case rate per 100,000 is 63.9. Those are very high numbers. That's just for COVID. Right. So, and the recommendations really, if, you have, if we have a high community prevalence, is that people should consider wearing masks in indoor spaces again. 
And if you're at high risk of getting sick, then you should consider you know, whether or not you should alter some of your activities. You know, especially if you're sick and you get respiratory illnesses, um, getting a test could be reasonable, especially for COVID because it has a prolonged quarantine. Um, but also just do those things um, that worked well during the pandemic and stay on top of what the community prevalence is. Uh, because, and this is especially true um, if you or loved ones are, are in a highly vulnerable group, meaning are you older than 65 or immunocompromised? Do you have other significant illnesses, heart ailments, lung ailments, or are you very young, less than two? Right. So, um, so now is a, another sort of period of uncertainty um, but we're, we'll, we'll do our best to try to make sure, you know, that we at San Juan Regional are here to take care of the needs of our community. Right. And, and as you've said, we've, you, we, you have more tools kind of in the toolbox, too, right, as we get a better understanding of all three of these diseases or viruses, um, COVID especially. And, of course, there are now vaccines that are available that, uh, that weren't before. And, and the new booster, the new vaccine, which really has been constructed to fight the latest variant that we're seeing uh, mostly with COVID cases now, right, which is Omicron, I think. Correct. So vaccination, fantastic tool. Uh, influenza vaccination has been around for a while. It is exceptionally effective. So reducing uh, rates of illness by 40 to 60 percent, reducing uh, rates of hospitalization and death by much higher than that. Very safe vaccination unless you have a specific contraindication. It's never too late to get your uh, influenza vaccination. It takes about two weeks to, uh, to really go into effect. Um, but if you haven't had it, go get it. Now, COVID vaccination, primary series is out there. And also that specific Omicron, or I guess it's a uh, bivalent booster has some of the original, some of the uh, Omicron in there to stimulate the appropriate response. Also very effective. And largely what we believe is the reason we're not seeing such a high number of inpatients with COVID now is because folks have either had it or they've been vaccinated for it. And therefore folks are not getting as sick from it. Now, there are treatments for flu, like Tamiflu, for example. Right. If you, within a day or two, you can get some Tamiflu tablets and you can reduce the severity of your illness, the duration of your illness. And there are treatments for COVID, um, and that includes uh, Paxlovid, Milnupiravir, and now Remdesivir for infusion. Um, and, but for RSV, we don't have a vaccination yet. And um, the treatments or the, there's a monoclonal antibody, which is in very short supply, which is only for really use in very young children for the series of uh, uh, injections that is not really available for, uh, for adults, uh, even those that are more vulnerable. But we are still eagerly awaiting a vaccine for RSV. And um, this year, it looks like they, they've made some significant progress and we're hoping that, that it will be present you know, especially uh, even if it's just in limited supply for highly vulnerable populations in the near future. Got you. And let me ask you, Dr. Greenberg, if, if someone had COVID-19, kind of the original COVID-19, and maybe they're re now reinfected with the Omicron variant, does, does having it previously still allow some protection, I suppose, some immunity, even though the virus has mutated and changed into this new Omicron variant? I, I, well, or is it in, hard to say? Is it case by case? I don't know. Well, in, in theory, in, in immunologically, yes. There would be some common features for coronaviruses that would, uh, that would carry over some degree of immunity. But let's remember, coronaviruses have been around for a very long time. That's very true. And the reason right. there's no vaccine for the common cold is because coronaviruses and rhinoviruses and other of the, the many viruses that cause that array of symptoms, they're notoriously difficult to target. And so uh, even if we have a, if you, so if you get vaccinated for COVID-19, what we hope to do is we hope to prevent severe illness. We hope to prevent hospitalization and death. Um, and as the virus changes, and we expect it to change, um, we hope that those immunologic benefits will carry over. Gotcha. But, and as it changes, you know, again, and it has changed, obviously, then in the past three years that we've been watching it, um, it's kind of gotten a little bit weaker, but then it's had some maybe other other aspects, too, of these new variants, right, that keep uh, all of us on our toes, I suppose. Well, let's remember it, it got worse and then it got better. Right. So there's some unpredictability associated with it. And we started with the, the wild type virus and then it changed to alpha you know, and then we had another big, the alpha was the, uh, the UK variant. And then we, we moved to the Delta variant, which was very severe. And then we went through a series of other uh, variants until we landed in Omicron. 
we'd like to see the virus become less virulent, cause less serious disease. Um, but I think that there are uh, virologists and immunologists that are looking very closely at the very specific variations on the virus and the viral genome to try to anticipate what the impacts would be. But it's a little bit of a wild card. Got it. And, and I, I always like to say when we talk about vaccines, because folks feel very strongly about vaccines that, you know, for any questions, I think folks should ask their primary care physician if they have certain health conditions or, or issues or questions about the vaccine. That's really the person that, that they should be talking with who knows their specific health conditions or their family's specific health conditions, not two guys on the radio. I think that that's absolutely true. Uh, and I think that it's very important that every one of these decisions is an individual decision. Best discussed with the, uh, the primary care physicians. Um, but these virus, these, uh, these vaccines are generally safe. And boy, do they work. You know, we, you know, the, um, every year, and this is a statistic I was hoping we could, we could talk about, but people don't realize how severe of an illness flu is. They talk about flu season. But really, it causes between 12 and 53,000 deaths per year in the United States. You know, and we often don't look at some of the statistics for RSV, sort of the uh, uh, under underlooked uh, statistics. But we we have a between 18 and 80,000. That's a whole lot of hospitalizations just for children less than five, and for those that are greater than 65, between 60 and 120,000. And now it's estimated that there may be six to 10,000 deaths related to RSV. But we have to put that into perspective because, you know, in the very short time frame that we've had the pandemic within the United States, the death rate associated with that has been extraordinarily high, over a million deaths for Americans since the beginning of the pandemic. So sobering numbers, but I think, I hope that the listeners can listen to that, realize that go talk to your doctor or go get that vaccine you've been putting off. Um, and then try to do the right thing and make sure that you're keeping track of uh, how things are in the community to protect the young, the old, and the vulnerable. Right. And here we are um, in the middle of the holiday season. Folks want to gather uh, for Christmas, for New Year's coming up. And again, I know there's some maybe folks that are hesitant to maybe do that. Maybe they want to go visit with an elderly relative, but maybe they have immunocompromised situation or they've got lung problems or pulmonary problems or things along that line. I mean, it's a, it really is a personal decision, I know. It can be very challenging, but let's remember there's lots of things that we've become very good at. Everyone's become so good at it. Washing your hands, right. wearing a mask, you know, um, you know, limiting contact if you are the person that's sick, um, you know, making sure the surfaces are clean, you know, making sure that you're trying to avoid touching your face. Those kinds of things, those practices, you know, wearing and selectively wearing a mask for visiting the vulnerable folks. Let's remember that the holiday season is a special time for everybody. And I think that we can do our best to try to stay safe without trying to uh, really turn everything upside down. Let's try to be smarter, not just go back to how, uh, not just lock everything down. Right. We have learned a lot in the last Absolutely. three years, for, for sure. Um, one thing I want to ask you, too, a little bit about is some of the, the recommendations from places like the CDC, the State Health Department, that have been, uh, the term, I think, is evolving. Um, a lot of folks would say, but they just said, you know, at the very beginning not to do this, but now they're saying to do this. And, and obviously, I think in any type of a evolving situation like we've seen with COVID-19 over the past three years, as we learn more, um, we learn more of how to hopefully combat it, to stay safe from it, things along that line, right? And things, recommendations would change, would evolve over time, wouldn't they? Yes. I, you know, Scott, that is absolutely true. And across the board, the one, I would say, concept that I think I would encourage everyone to be comfortable with and not resist is change. These things, they're going to change over time. And those folks that are trying to provide you with guidance, they're trying to provide you with the best guidance that's available for you at that moment. And so, you know, we've had to, as things evolved, you know, with hospital preparedness throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to change countless times. We have uh, sort of tried to embrace the idea of these pivots using science as the backbone that helps us navigate some of these uh, areas of uncertainty. Um, but it can be frustrating and it can be challenging and it can be difficult. And I absolutely understand those things, but let's try to stay a little nimble. Let's try to stay more uh, 
accepting of changes in the science, not necessarily changes in the rhetoric, but changes in the science. Let's use, let's use that to be our guiding light when it comes to how we should perhaps change some of our behavior. Right. And, and I would say, too, I guess if someone is questioning a, a change in recommendations, to ask the question why, and if you can get an answer as to why, then that may help you understand the reason behind the change. If there's a change and you ask why and there's no answer or no one could give you an answer, maybe that would be a reason to maybe question that, I suppose. I, I think asking questions is fantastic. Um, and I think <clears throat> getting really good, solid, science-based answers to these questions is fundamental for folks being comfortable with the idea of change. And so go to those places that you trust and you know are science-based. Go to the CDC website. Um, go to public health websites. You know, and avoid the more politically-oriented discussions. And really, like I said, use science as the guiding light here. Um, and then we'll be able to make rational choices and we'll all come out on the other end of this uh, winter of uncertainty, this triple-demic, uh, healthy and ready for uh, prosperous 2023. One final question about COVID-19, Dr. Greenberg, and that is the long COVID that you talked about earlier a little bit. And again, it seems like there's a lot of folks that, that are maybe suffering from the effects of long COVID or they think they are. And, and the medical community maybe doesn't know a lot or we're learning more and more each day about long COVID and how it affects people long term and trying to come up with treatments for, for them. But there still seems to be some unanswered questions with long COVID treatments. Well, Scott, I think you actually characterize that accurately. I think that we're still learning a lot about long COVID. Um, it's a frustrating illness because you get sick even with relatively minor COVID and then you have these long lasting symptoms that don't seem to abate. And there's a whole range of different symptoms from fatigue to chronic cough to vascular phenomena. It's very uh, difficult to characterize. But, you know, like I said, things are changing and things are getting better. And there are centers that are opening up that are studying long COVID. And we are um, getting better at identifying, characterizing long COVID and developing a new strategy to try to address those things. But we are not, it's not quite ready to uh, put into uh, any kind of standardized approach right now. And so um, the problem is, is that we lack definitive clear cut therapies for something that people are suffering with right now. And so, that's a very challenging sort of difficult spot for us because we want to be uh, able to do better for those folks that are suffering with this illness. But we are going to stay on top of it and uh, we're going to continue to develop and refine um, the care that we offer um, and look to experts and researchers to make sure that we're offering the best care available for this changing illness. Very good. Dr. Brad Greenberg is my guest this morning. He appeared numerous times, of course, during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're so happy to have him back in the studio this time for the very first time to speak with me a little bit about current conditions at San Juan Regional Medical Center. And I want to switch gears just slightly, Dr. Greenberg, about staffing and the overall health of the healthcare industry and the healthcare business. And we've seen shortages of people. Um, I know our hospital's not been immune from that, unfortunately. Um, but as things kind of get back to what we hope will be a normal situation, um, how are things looking at, uh, at, at San Juan Regional Medical Center, recruitment efforts, things along that line? What can you tell us? Well, you know, one thing that's really clear is that the last couple of years have been extraordinarily challenging for the healthcare industry at large. Um, I think the number that, that uh, is batted around now is that there's been the loss of about 330,000 healthcare workers across the country. Um, and so many places around the country continue to have challenges with staffing and recruitment. Uh, we continue to uh, you know, engage in strong recruitment efforts, but we continue to have staffing challenges that mirror those around the country. Um, and so the real issues is that that we have to make sure that we as a organization are able to meet the needs of our community and that the healthcare infrastructure from, you know, the brick and mortar stuff to the people that are taking care of you right at the bedside are there for you. And um, so it's been challenging and we're continuing to try to navigate what we describe as the, the new healthcare worker market um, to, uh, to make sure that we can meet the needs of the community. But this is a changing and challenging time um, where we're going to need to to develop uh, more professionals to enter the workforce, more nurses, um, and uh, perhaps more providers to make sure that we can meet the needs of our community. And the infrastructure that's there to support those those 
students, I guess, who are at nursing school or getting the training to, to get into the healthcare field? Is that, I mean, we have it here at San Juan College. I know we send a lot of students to San Juan Regional Medical Center. Great partnership to be able to have that funnel going into the hospital. Is that something that needs to be looked at as well or just need more, more of everything? I think that there are some uh, uh, really well-informed, you know, experts that are trying to grow and develop that now. So, you know, I think that uh, um, I want to make sure that those folks uh, are able to you know, comment more accurately about that. But I think that everyone is trying to build and develop the ability to produce the needed resources for our community and for the region. And so uh, it remains a challenge, um, but I know that there's lots of folks working hard on it. Well, and I know it, it's not just a San Juan regional problem either, or a San Juan County problem. It is a nationwide, probably worldwide problem. Is that what you hear? Definitely across our, our nation. It's a, a real challenge. Gotcha. Very good. Well, let's look ahead. We just have a couple minutes remaining this morning, Dr. Greenberg. And so as we enter into 2023, um, again, uh, we've got this flu, we've got COVID, we've got RSV. What what do you see kind of as the as the new year comes across as we hopefully get get healthier and, and, and move forward? What do you what do you project for the new year? Well, you know, what I what I hope is that uh, that we're able to weather the covid influenza and RSV challenges that we have in front of us now and that they wane. Uh, they showed up a little early. Let's hopefully they wane a little earlier. And then I hope what we can do is, uh, you know, with a combination of all the things that we've learned um, to figure out how to do the things like getting vaccinated, uh, staying home if you're sick, uh, masking when the time is right for masking, washing your hands, you know, all those things together uh, will help reduce the overall disease burdens, reduce it for, for any listener, for their friends, loved ones, um, any vulnerable folks in the community will reduce the impacts on, on our healthcare facility and the healthcare infrastructure in the region. So let's try to make good choices. I think uh, um, one of the things that I think is important and I want folks to understand is that this isn't trying to advocate for going back to how things were when everything was locked down, so to speak. Um, this, is a, this is trying to advocate for being smarter about how we make these choices. And that there's a time, and there will, there may be a time and a place uh, for uh, some of those things that we would become so good at. So just remember that you're very good at them, and don't don't be afraid to deploy those techniques that uh, that you become so proficient at. And then we can have a 2023 that hopefully will see us looking at all these challenges in the rearview mirror. Very good. But let's hope so. So wonderful. Dr. Brad Greenberg, thank you for coming in this morning and speaking with me. I really appreciate it. Again, our thanks to all the, the crew at Salmon Regional Medical Center who have put in very long days, very long hours to uh, get us through the last three years. And, uh, and we're glad that uh, things are a little bit closer to normal uh, for you and your colleagues. Thank you.